the mountain of the Lord and to the house of the God. Shabbat shalom, everybody. We are now at our Haftorah portion where we have our brother Eric come and share his thoughts, read the uh, Haftorah portion, which this week is due to Rosh Kodesh, is Yeshayahu Isaiah 66. And we ask Eric to come up and share with us what Yehovah has, has put on his mind and what he's revealed to him to encourage us with. So, Baruch Hashem. Welcome. Shabbat shalom. Shabbat shalom. <clears throat> so uh, today is uh, Rosh Hashanah, New Moon, uh, and whenever uh, Rosh Hashanah and Shabbat fall on the same day. Uh, we read from Isaiah, Yeshiyahu, the last chapter, 66. The reason for that is that uh, this last chapter of Isaiah is really talking about the Messianic era, uh, the age to come, what we would often consider to be the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven. And so starting in 66, Heaven is my throne, says Adonai, and the earth is my footstool. What kind of house could you build for me? What sort of place could you devise for my rest? Didn't I myself make all these things? This is how they all came to be. Uh, so the emphasis here really is in the age to come, Yehovah will not need a temple because no temple could really contain him anyway. The kind of person on whom I look with favor is one with a poor and humble spirit who trembles at my word. Those others might as well kill a person as an ox, as well break a dog's neck as sacrifice a lamb, as well offers pig's blood as offer a grain offering, as well bless an idol as burn incense. Just as these have chosen their ways and enjoy their disgusting practices, so I will enjoy making fools of them and bring on them the very things they fear. For when I called, no one answered. When I spoke, they did not hear. Instead, they did what was evil in my sight and chose what did not please me. Hear the word of Adonai, you who tremble at his word. Your brothers who hate you and reject you because of my name have said, Let Adonai be glorified so we can see your glory. But they will be, part, they will be put to shame. That uproar in the city, that sound from the temple, is the sound of Adonai repaying his foes what they deserve. Again, speaking of the age to come judgment. Before going into labor, she gave birth. Before her pains came, came, she delivered a male child. Who ever heard of such a thing? Who has ever seen such things? Is a country born in one day? Is a nation brought forth all at once? For as soon as Zion went into labor, she brought forth her children. Would I let the baby break through and not be born, asked Adonai? Would I, who caused the birth, shut the womb, ask your God? I'm going to pause here for one second because when I, when I read this, I've been doing a study for the last few months in Isaiah, a pretty in-depth study. Whenever I read this, it really reminds me of another passage I can't help think of in the New Testament. And that's where the conversation between Yeshua and Nicodemus occurs. It's one of the more difficult passages to understand 
Uh, most Gentiles would associate this with baptism, right? Immersion. Uh, and so I just want to take a little detour because this has really been kind of gnawing at me for some time now. So I'm going to read some of this. Uh, there was a man among the Perushim named Nicodemus, who was a ruler of the Judeans. This man came to Yeshua by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know it is from God that you have come as a teacher, for no one could do these miracles you perform unless God is with him. Yes, indeed, Yeshua said, I tell you that unless a person is born again, is delivered from above, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a grown man be delivered? Can he go back into his mother's womb and be delivered a second time? Yeshua answered, Yes, indeed, I tell you that unless a person is delivered from water and from spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. What is born of flesh is flesh, and what is born of spirit is spirit. Stop being amazed at my telling you that you must be delivered again from above. What's interesting in this passage is he says, stop being amazed at my telling you. You is plural. We don't have an equivalent word in English, but in Greek this is plural. So he's saying, stop being amazed at my telling you all that you must be delivered again from above. The wind blows where it wants to, and you hear its sound, but you don't know where it comes from or where it's going. That's how it is with everyone who has been delivered from the Spirit. Nicodemus replied, How can this happen? Yeshua answered him, You hold the office of teacher of Israel, and you don't know this? Now that conversation, I can't help but think of when I read this passage of Messianic error in Isaiah because it's a country born in one day. It's a nation brought forth all at once. And I think that Yeshua is really, uh, he's really understanding Isaiah here. This idea of, at the time Yeshua came, there were a lot of traditions of the elders because Pharisees felt like there was something that they could do to force the, mess the Messiah to come and the age to come, right? They had a lot of uh, additional traditions that they put on top of the Torah. And what I believe Yeshua is saying here is that God alone delivers, will deliver the nation, and it will come swiftly and it will come quickly. There's nothing that you can do to aid this along. And the, the beginning of this passage, before going into labor, she gave birth. Before her pains came, she delivered a male child. And that just was something that I've been thinking about for a very long time. I've looked through a lot of commentary, rabbinic and, uh, and uh, Christian commentary, and I haven't seen anyone make this connection. But I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to uh, uh, put this theory forward. If we go back to Genesis, and we read from Genesis chapter 3, it says, Adonai, God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, you are cursed, more than all livestock and wild animals. You will crawl on your belly and eat dust as long as you live. I will put animosity between you and the woman, and between your descendants and hers. He will bruise your head, and you will bruise his heel. Listen to this next passage. To the woman he said, I will greatly increase your pain in childbirth. You will bring forth children in pain. So with that, how can somebody give birth before the pains come? And I wonder, does this is Isaiah referring here to the reverse of the curse? Right? The curse would be lifted. Because how can a woman give birth without pain? We know from Genesis that this is part of the curse. And Paul makes a similar, a similar connection in Galatians. He says, the Messiah redeemed us from the curse. 
pronounced in the Torah by becoming cursed on our behalf. For the Tanakh says, everyone who hangs from a stake comes under a curse. So he's quoting Deuteronomy. So we have this kind of interesting uh, parallel. And again, I just wonder if Isaiah here isn't hinting at that. You know, the Messiah will come uh, and he will suffer, but he will come again and lift the curse once and for all. Deliver the nation of Israel and along with it, the rest of the nations. It's kind of a very interesting uh, sort of thought that I've had going on. So picking up in Isaiah verse 66, verse 10. Rejoice with Jerusalem. Be glad with her. All you who love her, rejoice, rejoice with her. All of you who mourn for her, so that you nurse and are satisfied by her comforting breasts, drinking deeply and delighting in the overflow of her glory. For Adonai says, I will spread shalom over her like a river, and the wealth of nations like a flooding stream. You will nurse and be carried in her arm and cuddled in her lap. Like someone comforted by his mother, I will comfort you in your shalom. You will be comforted. Your heart will rejoice at the sight. Your bodies will flourish like newly sprouted grass. It will be known that the hand of Adonai is with his servants but with his enemies his fury. For look, Adonai will come in fire, and his chariots will be like the whirlwind, to render his anger furiously, his rebuke with blazing fire. For Adonai will judge all humanity with fire and with the sword, and those slain by Adonai will be many. Those who consecrate and purify themselves in order to enter the gardens, then follow the one who was already there, eating pig meat, reptiles, and mice, will all be destroyed together, says Adonai. For I know their deeds and their thoughts. The time is coming when I will gather together all nations and languages. They will come and see my glory, and I will give them a sign. I will send some of their survivors to the nations of Tarshish, Paul, Lud, Tuval, Greece, and more distant coasts where they have neither heard of my fame nor seen my glory. They will proclaim my glory in these nations, and they will bring all your kinsmen out of all the nations as an offering to Adonai, on horses, in chariots, in wagons, on mules, on camels, to my holy mountain in Jerusalem, says Adonai. Just as the people of Israel themselves bring their offerings in clean vessels to the house of Adonai. I will also take Kohanim and Levim from them, says Adonai. For just as new heavens and new earth that I am making will continue in my presence, says Adonai, so will your descendants and your name continue. From new moon to new moon, every month on Rosh Hashanah, and every week on Shabbat, Everyone living will come to worship in my presence, says Adonai. As they leave, they will look on the corpses of the people who rebelled against me. For their worm will never die, and their fire will never be quenched. But they will be abhorrent to all humanity. And that is uh, another reference, a reference here to Gehenna, which would be translated in most... English interpretations as hell or Hades, uh, but Yeshua says, better that, better that you should be one-eyed but enter the kingdom of God rather than keep both eyes and be thrown into Gehenna, Gehenna, where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. So this is clearly referencing the messianic error, and we can see Yeshua all over this, the Messiah fulfilling these prophecies uh, just as he said he came to not abolish the Torah but to fulfill it and to fulfill these prophecies Shabbat Shalom Thank you Thank you Eric a lot of things to think about there it's uh Boy, we could just do a teaching on that, couldn't we? So, thank you, Eric. Okay.
Well, Shabbat Shalom, everyone. This is uh, a very interesting transition from the Eric's discussion on the Haftorah and Yeshayahu and me trying to, last week the video stopped and it was such a good message tying together the mitzvot and some things in the epistles, particularly Ephesians, that point believers in a certain way that personally I think is ignored. Perhaps in the church and even in the Messianic community, I think there's some very interesting things in the synagogue that I would almost say they're more attentive to these things because it sur surrounds the Torah. It's all about the Torah and all that's written on it in the Mishnah and the Midrash. And it, it, it just really brings it to life, gives it meaning and depth. And so what I want to do today, I want to finish basically some points in Beishalach and Yitro, which I don't even think I got to last Shabbat on the, on the video, but I'm doing this because we have people that regularly watch the, the YouTube video, and I just want to do justice to giving them the whole message. So please bear with me if you've heard some of this stuff today, but you'll see how this segues right into this this portion, Mishpatim, which in this portion we have 53 mitzvot, 23 positive and 30 negative. Now, were you aware that there's positive and negative commandments? The negative ones, make sure you listen to them and you apply them in your life. The positive ones, you choose to receive the blessing of honoring them and walking them out. It's up to you. Okay? But it's not as serious. I don't even know if I want to use the word serious, but God gives us freedom certain things, and these are some of the certain things, the positive mitzvot, which uh, honestly I think most people are inclined to do that. <laughs> some may not because they're just not aware, or they miss it, or they don't realize it. The, the whole journey of the Torah is, is that it's a journey. We're not capable of, you know, perfectly keeping every mitzvah. But when we get the Vayikra, it says that the Torah is what sanctifies us. So really, the journey is about being sanctified. And the mitzvot as they apply to our lives and situations, sanctifies, bring us in alignment and in oneness with Yehovah and His ways, not our ways. So, basically, the mitzvot, the laws cover the indentured servant, punishments for murder, kidnapping, assault, theft. They're rules that govern relationships between people. Laws, we have these laws today in our own society. They're 
really every nation and culture God declared during the time from Adam to, to Noah and even from Noah on that they have certain rules and laws and civil order in their cultures. However that is meted out. Some could be dictatorial. But God requires that there be order. And, you know, understanding of guidelines in a, in a, in a community, in a, in a nation, in amongst people. So, he's commanded us, the Torah has commanded us to observe these laws. And some things go without saying. Some people in conscience just it's part of what God's programmed into us. We have an instinct, uh, our spirits, an inclination to say, you know, this doesn't seem right. Or, I don't think I should do this. You know? So, but what it does is the Torah establishes the elements necessary to have a civilized society. And within the community of believers, God's word and instructions allow for us to have a peaceful, holy, harmonious relationship amongst one another. And some of that is forgiveness, restitution, re reconciliation, which we don't see a whole lot of that, do we? Even within the religious community. That's why we have 45,000 different denominations in the Christian religion. The Jewish community has pretty well managed to maintain a very small, limited number of sects that all share a common faith, the 13, the list of 13 faiths that they all follow. And so we need something to keep us civil. And so we see a nation coming out of Egypt, a mixed multitude, and before in Israel they were governed by basically a king. So whatever the king said is what you did. God rules by his word and the orders that he's laid out, and that's what we have with Mishpatim, and we're going to go through that, and it's with that that I want to connect the Torah, the mitzvot, to the Gospel and Epistles. But to pick up where we left off last week for the sake of our, our YouTube listeners and the people that really, really look forward, I, I hope they do. <laughs> I, I won't say I'm necessarily the greatest teacher or, or uh, you know, I'm just a, just, just a shepherd, <laughs> just a shepherd boy. Um, I just speak from my heart. I think that's what God wants. I trust that he works and wills within me to do what he so pleases to bring forth his words, not mine. So, we're going to go over where we left off last week was uh, in the, uh, the section where the, the manna and God giving out the instruction of how food is going to be provided through the daily appearance of manna on the ground. And 
it's interesting that this was a very, very important symbolic illustration by God to who He is, to the, to, to the, to the nation, and to the mixed multitude. And we see here He says that, let two quarts of manna be kept through all your generations, so that they will be able to see the bread which I fed you in the desert when I brought you out of Egypt. Now, that's huge. So Moshe and Aaron took a jar, put, put in it two quarts of manna, and set it aside before Anna, Adonai to be kept through all generations. God wants us to remember the things He's done for us in our lives. I'd encourage you to have a journal and write down events in your life that stand out where you know unequivocally that God has intervened in your life in a way that has preserved you, whether it was physically, spiritually, mentally, emotionally. The Israelites, the mixed multitude, their backs were against the Sea of Suf. And just, just like you did, we cried out to God for deliverance. Things haven't changed. Whether you were part of the two and a half million on the, the, the beach of current day Nawab on the Sea of Suf, he cried out to God and he, he responded. So we see that it's a display of God's provision and it mirrors certain qualities about God that appear in his word. If there was provision every day, every morning, and on the sixth day they gathered a double portion, well, can anybody think of the character of God, even in the Psalms where he says, my mercies are new every morning. When did the manna appear? In the morning. What is mercy? Provision to your spirit. Strength whatever you need for the day. And so, we see as the Israelites, the mixed multitude, traveled on in stages, they got a little grumpy and, and grumbled and quarreled with Moses after God showed them he was going to provide food for them every day. Nothing to fear, nothing to worry about. How would you like if, if God said, Salome, I'm going to make sure that your refrigerator is filled every, every week. At the end of the week, I'm just going to put in there what you need for the week. And I'm going to refill it. It's basically what he did, if I put it in a form relating to today versus then, But we toil. Why do you toil and worry? Your Father in heaven, do the sparrows toil? No. God wants us to learn that He is our provider, no matter what it is. I had a really rough week again. <laughs> uh, I really scrambled to get assemble this message because I had a vehicle that broke down. My alternator went and I was stuck. But God brought all the elements together to help me get back on the road in order to take care of the things I take care of. People, messages, so forth. That's provision to me. That's manna. That's manna. So, so, as they 
travel in stages after having crossed the Sea of Self. They camped at Rephidim. And they started quarreling with Moses. And he, and he says, what are you testing me for? Or why are you testing Adonai? When we get discontented with our situation, do we grumble to God? Is it any different? We're on a journey out of this world to transition into the kingdom of God. What did, what did Eric read from, from Yeshayahu 66? What does God favor? The poor and the humble. He's there to listen and to respond to them. Not the high and mighty. Not the wealthy. Why do you think it says it's harder for a wealthy person to enter into the kingdom of God? It's even harder than when it to, to fit through the eye of the needle or, or the in, in, in the walled cities in ancient times where where a camel had to unpack his saddle, everything, stripped down clear of all the possessions of that person and had to kneel down. The camel had to kneel and crawl through the eye of the needle just to enter the walled city. It's important we know where our hearts are at with what we have that isn't really even ours belongs to God. And he says, take care of your neighbor. Share. If you have the resources to bless your neighbor, I'm telling you, you're, that, that's what I expect of you. That's why I gave it to you. To prove you and test you to see how you would respond with my wealth, not yours. I can take it away like that. So, Israel and the mixed multitude, they got upset with God and said, did you bring us up from Egypt to kill us? And our livestock? Because they didn't have water. Now, it's really kind of mind-boggling. And again, I see this as their children, spiritual children entering in to the knowledge and understanding of God. And just as a parent refines and grooms a child, the mixed multitude and the children of Israel were being groomed. I don't think God, I, I think he, he even chuckled when they started grumbling. I think it says, boy, that Billy, let me tell you, he gets upset over such little things. He just, he, he doesn't have the full picture up here yet, you know? What do they say? Men's brains don't develop till they're, what, 24? Women's, vein, women's brains develop a lot quicker. So, um, so, we see then, we understand why God told them to bring their, their weapons, because next... Amalek fought with Israel at Rephidim. Okay. So they acted. Moshe acted. This is where I believe uh, the, the battle. Moses' hands were lifted up. And they got tired. Joshua and I think Caleb held them up. But what's interesting with this 
is, again, it's another test. No food, no water. But you're not a slave anymore. We're a slave to Yehovah, who is good and kind and compassionate. But he wants to refine us and prepare us and sanctify us to enter his kingdom. So he gives us our lifetime to pursue that and experience it. And we all have bumps in the road where we get upset and, you know, we don't cooperate with God, with our neighbor, with, you know, life as it is. But hopefully we learn. We surrender. We surrender our self-desires and lay them at His feet. Because who's our example? You read in Philippians 2, Yeshua came down from heaven and He surrendered all His power and glory. I, I call that humbling yourself before Yehovah. And remember, Yeshua was both God and man. He was part divine, but he had a physical body. And he was subjected to all the things that everybody else was subjected to in this world. That's really important. He had the power and authority, the divinity to do easily what he wanted to do, but, but he surrendered that. And you know what? He's going to surrender that for eternity. Because he's seated at the right hand of the Father, and the Father will rule. Yeshua will rule here on earth. A little different. So, so, Amalek, he has a battle with them, and I want to point out that Amalek, God said to Amalek, he says, write this in a book to be remembered. Again, remembered if God asked Moses to keep a book of remembrances, why shouldn't we? Why shouldn't we in our time in prayer go back through our lives and say, God, you, you preserved me through this. I'm still alive. I could have got caught up in this. Okay. If I were there, I would look back and say, Amalek could have destroyed us. The Egyptians could have destroyed us. But God, you were there protecting us and covering us. Where is it in your life that you can remember tragic or potentially tragic situations where God showed up? Something happened that preserved you and saved you. Do you give the credit to the creator of the universe? Or do you take the path of pride and say, well, I did it. You know, I did this and I did this. And that's what got me out of it. You're stealing God's glory if you do that. Because He issues your every breath. And so we see that God says to Moses, build an altar. And He called it Adonai Nisi. Adonai is my banner, my miracle. Because and we see this in present day. This was prophesied back then, and it continues to take place even today. God said, build an altar, and know me as your banner, as your miracle. Because their hand, the Amalekites, was against the throne of Yah, Adonai will fight Amalek generation after generation. 
that's still going on today. What we see in the Middle East is the descendants of Amalek fighting God. Remember, not Israel. With all that's going on there, I say, this isn't against Israel. This is against God. And they're fighting God. Guess what? God wins. At the end of the day, He wins. In your own life, in your journey, in your travels, as you're being proven and tested and sanctified and refined, God overcomes. Whatever it is, He overcomes. The glory belongs to Him. He empowers you. It ain't you. God's looking in favor upon those who are poor and humble. Can you be poor of spirit in your struggles, in your challenges? Can you humble yourself before God? Can you humble yourself before your neighbor who helps you? It's all part of it. God... Yeshua is the epitome of humility. He really is. God said, I, my ear is leaning towards those who are of a humble and contrite heart. Does anybody know what the word contrite means? Do you ever hear of powder, like Johnson's baby powder? It's not a commercial. <laughs> okay. Well, it has a consistency, but so does talcum. Talcum is pulverized. It's reduced to the lowest possible denominator of materiality. And it's, that's why it's so smooth and sleek. But we go through our lives and we get contrited. Because God's trying to mold us and make us into something for his kingdom and eternity. This is just this is just preparation here. And so it's important that we learn the constitution of the kingdom of God, which is the Torah. It wasn't done away with, as Eric shared with us. It was fulfilled. In other words, everything that needed to be in the scriptures are in there for our consumption, to prepare us. It's the, my one friend calls it boot camp. We're in boot camp. And this is the operational manual of what we're going to take you through at boot camp. Did you get one of those, Eric? <laughs> he was in the Marines, so he was, in, he, he, went, he was in the Gulf War, so he knows. Very interesting. So, I want to move on to Jethro, Yitro, Moses' father-in-law. And what's very unique in his case is when Moshe and him were sharing in, his, in Moshe's tent of what God had done for the people of Israel and the mixed multitude, it basically was a testimony to Jethro of the power and glory of God to deliver people. Now understand that those times, ancient times, what was the character of, of, of the landscape? There were basically tyrants, kings, no different than, than countries today where they have a Marxist communist and even in, even in a, a uh, democracy there's leaders that pull all the strings that affect people and in, in a sense can also enslave them no different than, than a, uh, a communist regime it's no different. You're under their thumb, their heel. They tell you the way things are going to be done. 
Fortunately, in a democracy, there's a little bit more freedom, I would say. They let you out of the cage for a while. So you have some free room to roam. Okay? And so, we see in chapter, in chapter 18, Jethro declares and shares with Moses, says, Moses, now, verse 11 and 12, now I know, understand Jethro was a polytheist. He believed in many gods. That was the nature of the ancient world. They believed in many gods. There were, there were, there were only righteous men, even some of the Bedouins, that knew of Yehovah, that believed in the one God. I'll give you an example. But now we have a man that followed many gods come to a place where he's converted, where he is he, he comes to understand the difference between the gods of the nations and the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He says and declares, verse 11, I, I, now I know that Adonai is greater than all other gods because he rescued those who were treated so arrogantly. Sound familiar? Jethro, Moshe's father-in-law. This is where we know he had a real salvation experience. Okay? And it, no different than the salvation experience that people have today by the blood saving, sacrificing, and toning blood of Yeshua. It says, the father-in-law brought a burnt offering and sacrifices to God, and Aharon came with all the leaders of Israel to share the meal before God with Moshe's father-in-law. He sacrificed an offering and shed blood. No different than the sacrifice of Abel, Moshe, and Avraham when he offered up a, a sacrifice. It's the same thing. The system in place at that time, first of all, if God is in everything, which he is because he created, everything has an essence of the parts of himself and his essence. So the essence of God is in the blood of everything. And if God chose clean, kosher animals as sacrifices in the interim until his plan for Yeshua to come and be the ultimate sacrifice, then that bloodshed was just as powerful and valid as Yeshua. It's part of God's plan. And it's, it's no longer in place. It's no longer God's path to salvation. And so we see that Jethro truly becomes a believer in the one God, El Elyon. And as we go further on in Jethro, we see... Um, they come down the mountain from where they had offered the sacrifice. And God then gives forth his, the, the Ten Commandments, the Ten Sayings. And I'll just point out a few things. No other gods before me. God says, I'm a jealous God. Punishing the children for the sins of the parents to the third and fourth generation and those who hate me. Do not use lightly the name of Adonai your God. Adonai will not leave unpunished someone who uses his name lightly. 
So be careful how you use Yehovah's name in the place, in the situation. When people curse God by using his name in vain, they're playing with fire. Now, they're not condemned if they're not believers. But boy, we better repent immediately when, if we ever are somehow influenced to use God's name in vain or to carelessly banner it about. Remember this Shabbat. Not only you, but your servants, your slaves, which is the, the, the way things were, the culture back then, there were slaves, just like there's still slaves in that culture today. It was an economic thing. People couldn't pay their debt or needed food, they, they became slaves. They worked, and if they didn't, weren't able to repay their debts, they became slaves to that master until they paid the debt off. Is it any different today? We're, we're slaves. You know, the borrower is servant to the lender. Let's, let's kind of even say the borrower is a slave to the lender. Has anything really changed? Do not honor your, fa honor your father and mother. Do not murder. Do not, do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Don't give false evidence. Do not covet your neighbor's house, wife, slave, ox, anything that belongs to your neighbor. And so that takes me into Mishpatim. So we're seeing a nation of people that is being groomed, being taught God's ways. All the other nations rejected it. And so I go to Ephesians 2.17. You see, some of those people that were a mixed multitude were foreigners and strangers to the God of Israel. But they were just coming in and believing. So they were going to be they were going to be taught to walk according to the Hebrews. Who were they brought into? They were brought into the nation of Israel. The shadow of non-Hebraic children or people not of Israel, not of the descendants of Abraham, but a shadow that God has provided salvation for all people, that there would be all those that would be included in the nation of Israel. Okay? And so this is just a shadow. But we see in, in Ephesians 2, 17, he says, 17 to 22, he says, Also when he came, he announced as good news, Shalom to you, us who are far off, and Shalom to those nearby. News that through him we both have access in one spirit to the Father. So then, both Jew and Gentile, have access to the Father, one Spirit. So then, if you have that access, you are no longer a foreigner or a stranger. On the contrary, you're fellow citizens with God's people and members of God's family. That was the whole shadow to be to be illustrated. Now, if, if, if you look at this in the context of what was going on, this was 60 uh, uh, CE, 60 years. That, that, that's what uh, 30 years after after Yeshua 
resurrected and ascended. So Paul is talking to the Ephesians and saying, you are now citizens with God's people, the Jews, the Hebrews. He meant that then. It still holds true today. Okay, if you're a Goy or a Gentile, Goy in Hebrew means of the nations. Gentile is the more modern English reference. But when you believe in Yeshua and the sacrificial act of <coughs> being crucified on the torture stake, the shed blood is the, the key. Life for life. God demands, if he poured into us his breath of life, and we've rebelled against him, which is what mankind did, then, then that life is being snuffed out. It says that Adam and Eve were pushed out of the garden. They were banned from the garden. They no longer had access to a holy God. So, for that violation, there had to be shed blood. As we'll get into Leviticus, Vayikra, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. Even back then, during the time of the tabernacle and the sacrifices. Because the life is in the blood. Do you see that? That is the key. It hasn't changed. It's the blood that keeps us animated and alive. But it's the breath of God that breathed in to each one of us at birth. What do we, what do, we do? I, I mentioned this last week. What do they do when a baby comes out? They, they do something to startle him and he goes, <gasps> and starts crying. Well, what is he doing? That, that child is breathing in. He's not going. There was nothing in there to begin with. He had to breathe in the atmosphere around him. Well, who, who supplies the atmosphere? Our creator, Yehovah. So, so, just as Jethro became a believer by believing in God's miracles and exploits of delivering out of Egypt. So the parallel, Egypt enslaved in bondage, when we are separated from God because of our sin, when we are subjugated to this world and the, 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 the various, you know, just pitfalls and the, 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 the evil in this world, we're in bondage until God shows us his salvation through Yeshua and then we begin to learn to walk according to his ways. It should be the same now as it was then. But everybody says, oh, the Torah was, was fulfilled. We don't need to know that. Really? Well, I'll tell you what. What I want to do is we're going to go through these 54, not all of them, I just highlighted some. And I pointed out where I want, I'd, I'd like people to volunteer to read so we can see that this mitzvah written in the Torah in Shemot, Exodus, Exodus, 23 and Exodus 22, 21, which is the Torah, also exists in the Gospels and the Epistles. So how is it that the Torah has been done away with the law? Because this is the law that we're reading right now. It hasn't been done away with. 
the fundamental foundational principles are there. And even some verbatim in the epistles that Paul taught. Why? Because that's the context. He was teaching them the Torah. It applied then, it applies now. And if you don't think so, well, then you're deceived. And I would be concerned about whether you enter the kingdom of God if you don't know and are not subjected to the Torah, the sanctification power that's, that's contained in the Torah. God said the Torah is what sanctifies you. That means it makes you holy. It delivers you from sin and, and bondage. That the journey through your life, God will see that you're completely sanctified. The final sanctification is when Yeshua comes and then we will be like Him. Okay? And so, I'd like to start with chapter 21. Okay? Of Shemot, and I want to I want to bear bear in mind with Ephesians. It says uh, let me read this, and then I'll, I'll it says this is Ephesians uh, uh, seventeen to twenty-two, um, chapter two. On the contrary, you are fellow citizens with God's people and members of God's family. You have been built on the foundation of the emissaries and the prophets with the cornerstone being Yeshua the Messiah himself. In union with him, the whole building is held together and it is growing into a holy temple in union with Yehovah. Yes, in union with him. You yourselves are being built together into a spiritual dwelling place for God. You are the temple of the Holy Spirit. So if you don't think you need to be kosher, it's not about the animals. It's about honoring God's Word. That's what it's about. It's revering the Torah. Revering God's Word and understanding the context. As I said before, the vision that Peter had about the sheep coming down with clean and unclean has nothing to do with what you eat. It has everything to do with what's clean and unclean according to God's order and what He requires. He doesn't want to enter a temple that's filled with unclean things. So, think twice about receiving the Holy Spirit, the Ruach HaKadosh, if you're caught up in unclean things. Does, the, does, does God really enter His temple? I don't know. I'm just thinking rationally, deductive reasoning. God says, you know, my temple must be clean and holy. There's no unclean animals even in the tabernacle. All the sacrificial animals were clean animals. And so, let's go and connect the dots here. In 21, it says in, uh, in, the, in the Torah, it says... Honor your mother and your father. What does that mean? Well, he expounds on that a little bit by saying, don't curse your father or mother. I'd say that's not honoring them. No attacking, fighting, or, or causing injury upon your father or your mother. I would say that's called honoring them. We hear it all the time. Or a, a, a child, a, a teen, a young adult, even an old adult. I think there was one recently down in, in Bucks County or Delaware County. You know? It, it, it's 
It's real. Do not steal an ox or a sheep. Now, now let me ask you a question. Is the reason you think that the Torah was done away with because we don't have any ox and sheep that we use today? Is that why you think it doesn't apply anymore? If you do, you're missing the point. What is the principle that God is laying out here? You have a human being, your neighbor, who owns something of value in that culture, an ox or a sheep had a economic material value. It was the engine that was used to farm and to make wool. It was of value. Okay? It was a means to make a living. And so, what about if somebody drives a tractor trailer to make their living? And somebody steals it. Have there been tractor trailers stolen before? Well, so what's the difference? Whether it's an ox, a sheep, or an 18-wheeler. It was stolen. And what does God's ways and order have to say about that? Well, we see this happening within our legal system, which is actually broken. But the point is, and I just want to say, our Constitution was established on the Torah, the principles, the principles of our Constitution were founded on the Torah principles. But if you steal an ox or a sheep, you got to pay five times the value of an ox. So in order to do restitution, if a ox was worth $500, in order to make restitution, you had to pay, pay back $2,500, right? That still holds true today. You steal somebody's car, the insurance, we have a different system, the insurance companies compensate you if you have the coverage. And hopefully the person that stole it is, has to pay restitution. That's, that's within our civil laws, you see. See, the Torah is not all spiritual stuff. God was laying out the framework for a civil society. Up to that point, it wasn't fair. What did Jethro say? He said, I forget what it was, but I mentioned it, it stuck out to me. That, it, that, you know, God delivered you from a tyrant, you know, Pharaoh. Okay? Where there's no fairness, no equity. And we're seeing that in our culture today disintegrating. We have two violations of the federal government of, of taking top secret classified information. One gets off and one is being, is attempting to be prosecuted. Not even following the proper order and framework of, of the, the justice system. Here's another one, chapter 22. And there's 54 of them. I'm not going to go through all of them. I just want to pick some out and connect them. A thief breaking into a home, okay, can be beaten to death. It's not considered murder. That's what God said. That's what's in the Torah. Guess what's in our laws? Somebody enters your home, you have a gun, you can kill them. That's, that's our laws. Where did that come from? 
right here from the Torah. Why do you think they're trying to destroy and reconstitute our legal system in this country? They hate God. The communists, the Marxists, the socialists, the secular humanists want nothing to do with the belief system of a supreme being to whom they're accountable to. To whom we're accountable to. So, they want to change this country and our constitution and our laws to not reflect the Torah and the king and really the way it was established at our founding. All right, let's let's get some scripture. Have some people read something. I need someone to read James one twenty seven. When I call on you. And that mitzvot is do not abuse a widow or an orphan. That's in the Torah. Oh, but, but that's okay. We don't have to worry about that anymore. That's been done away with. Right? It's been fulfilled. It's been done away with. Now, fortunately, it's in the... It's in the epistles. It's in James 127. The spirit of this mitzvah is in James 127. I'm going to give another one out so we can save some time here where you can look some of these up. It says, here's another one. You are not to curse God or a leader of your people. So, you don't curse God, you don't curse the pastor, or the rabbi, or the leader of a small group. You don't do that, because God put them there. You, you're, not, you're not cursing them, you're cursing God. You're questioning God's soundness in putting that person in a position of authority. You need to pray for that person. That, that grace would abound for them. That they would come closer to Yehovah. That they would reconcile their ways. That they would be awakened. That, they, that God would give them vision and, and, and revelation to overcome this part of their personality, their life, their habits, their upbringing that has refined them into this kind of person that irritates you. Guess what? They're being sanctified too. And if you're not praying for them and honoring them, you're limiting their sanctification. You're, you're not being used as an instrument of God as part of being available to help sanctify that person. It's really, really, I, I mean, I'm serious. That, that goes with husbands and wives. Doesn't it say that the husband sanctifies the wife? Or covers her? Something to be looked into there. Okay, so, so I have James 1.27... 1 Peter 5.5 5, Do not curse God or a leader of your people. Here's another one. Do not delay offering from your harvest grain, olive oil, or wine. Offering. Offering into the temple. Okay. Their grain, their olive oil, their wine was the, was the uh, a form of uh, of of uh, transactions of for things. I give you a flask of oil, you give me a bale of hay. <laughs> you know? Or you I give you five flasks of olive oil and you give me a lamb that I can butcher and have food for my family. 
It was a means of exchange. No different than money today. So the Lord's basically saying, the principle is, don't delay, don't delay offering into God's house. Don't delay it. Don't hoard it. Don't hold it back. When you have it, give it. The portion that belongs to God. It's that simple. Are we all good at that? Do we fail? Absolutely. That's, that's what if we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins. But if we don't know the Torah, if we don't know, here's a whole different perspective on, on an offering before the Lord. And tithes and offerings. Acts 21.25 Who's going to look up Acts 21? Who has 1 Peter? I, I, I'd like... You got 1 Peter uh, 5 5. I need someone to get Acts 21 25. I need you to raise your hand to let me know so I, I know that I can move on. All right, Eric. Um, it says, You, this is a mitzvah in the Torah. You are to be my specially separated people. You are not to eat any flesh torn by wild animals. In other words, you can't eat roadkill. <laughs> that's basically what it's saying. Or an animal that's been torn and, and gouged by another wild animal. Why is that? Because when that happens, that shock, that trauma goes through that animal's body and changes the chemistry and the enzymes in that animal's body. And if, again, if you're, if you're eating it rare or medium rare, guess what? The life is in the blood and you are ingesting some of the, 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 the essence of that animal, okay? You, you, you're, you're taking that into your body. You wonder why people are so angry. What are they eating? Are they eating rare steaks of animals that were, you know, wild? Were, were you know, were, were uh, uh, combunctious animals on the farm? You know, there's bad dogs, there's, there's bad cows. <laughs> there's dogs that are nasty. There's cows that are nasty. There's horses that are great. And they're not kosher, but my grandfather had a horse for him. And I met a few, you know, nasty horses that with their hind legs kicked people in their behind. Not expecting it. Just rearing up and kicking. So... Who wants to read 1 Timothy 3.11 and 5.13? Do I have a volunteer? I need someone to read. And then John 3, the, 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 the epistle of John. John 3, chapter 1, verse 10. All right, so, Timothy, what's that? First Timothy 1. Uh, first Timothy 3.11 and 5.13. I got 3.11. I got the 3.11. What's Timothy, that? First Timothy 3.11. I got that. Do you have it? Yes. Okay, when I'm ready to go over that, I will call on you. Okay. Alright, so let's go back again. What are we doing? We're connecting mitzvot in the Torah that supposedly was done away with that actually is in the Gospels and the Epistles. Well, that means it wasn't done away with. Right? It's there for a reason. And the body of knowledge and application in in Judaism is vast. 
with the writings in the, the Midrash and the Mishnah and the Talmud. Now some of it you know, may, may not be for some people, but there's value there, deep value that the rabbis have compiled to understand the depth of why God says, do this, don't do that. So, do not abuse a widow or an orphan. We find that in James 127. Who did I, who did I, who has that? James 127? James 127. Yeah, I got it. Go ahead, read it loud. The religious observance that God the Father considers pure and faultless is this, to care for orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being contaminated by the world. So, we're not supposed to abuse. Is ignoring the widows and the orphans abusing them in our community? I think so. Where are you, church? Where are you, synagogue? It seems like the government's doing everything. No wonder, no wonder we're, 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 you know, we're enslaved. No wonder they keep encroaching and passing laws and laws and laws. The churches and the synagogue's hands are tied. They can't do what God's Word says. Something to think about. Can we do those things in America? Yes. But there's a point, as you shared, where there's certain things that you were prohibited from doing when you were, were being a foster mom. You were not able to execute the Word of God and God's mitzvot in order to help transform an orphan's life that's abuse are you with me all right first peter 5 5 says you are not to curse god or a leader of your people who's a leader of your people a pastor a rabbi an elder Okay, anyone that's in a position within the community of believers that God has put there. Because when you rebel against them, when you criticize them, when you talk them down, you're talking God down. I don't care how right or wrong you are. God says don't do it. Pray. Fast. Humble yourself. Seek the Lord. You you might be surprised the miracles that will take place in that person's life. First Peter 5.5 5. Who has that? I do. Go ahead, stand up and speak loudly. In the same way, you younger ones, be subject to elders and gird yourself with humility with one another, for Elohim resists the proud, but gives favor to the humble. Right. Right. Now, there's other verses I could connect with this as well, which I didn't have the time to look up. I've had a rough week. I shared that with you, and uh, so this this is what I got. <laughs> We're going to have to be content with that. All right. Um, how about Acts 21-25? I got it. Uh, however, in regard to the Goyim who have come to trust in Yeshua, we all joined in writing them a letter with our decision that they should abstain from what had been sacrificed to idols from blood and from what strangled and from fornication. Okay. So... This was after Yeshua resurrected. This is 30 years later. 
I don't see where where they speaking to new believers. The first boy that came into receiving Yeshua and believing in him, okay, it was 17 years after Yeshua resurrected and ascended. That was Cornelius the centurion. And so now we have this being taught as far as the boundaries, the mitzvot. They basically set up some boundaries, some mitzvot of what, what characterizes a initial believer coming into the synagogue, coming into the community of believers. And if you didn't do that, then you were suspect. And so here it is in the book of Acts. What not to eat. That was common. Drinking blood was common. Eating meat that was sacrificed to idols. Eating roadkill was common. And I dare say that there's believers that do it today. They see a freshly, you know, uh, killed deer alongside the road. May even have witnessed it, been in a car behind it. And I know of examples where people would just grab that animal, throw it in the back of their pickup, take it home, and cut it up and eat it. It's not, it's not good for you. That animal had been traumatized. The enzymes and the, the, the essence, the, the chemistry of that animal is so charged in a negative way. It's not good for your body. Okay, 1 Timothy 3.11, it says, well, in the Torah it says, do not repeat false rumors or gossip. Basically, that's what it's saying. 1 Timothy 3.11, 5.13, go ahead, loudly. 1 Timothy 3.11, command these things and teach them. Don't let anyone look down on you because of your youth. On the contrary, set the believers an example in your speech, behavior, love, trust, and purity. Shall I keep reading? Can you speak a little louder? Um, what, do you want me to continue reading? What's that? Should I continue reading? Yeah, it's, it's 311 and 513. Okay. Okay, 513. Besides that, they learn to... They learn to... To be idle, going around from house to house, and not only idle, but gossips and busybodies, saying things they shouldn't. Therefore, I would rather the young widows get married, have children, and take charge of their homes so as to give the opposition no occasion for slandering us. Okay. The point is just in this context, in this situation, speaking to women, there's other places where it's independently not male or female, it's talking to basically a believer. No gossip. No gossip. No rumors. Why do you think Yeshua overcame the Pharisees that accused the woman of adultery? It says in the Torah, and this is a mitzvot, let a matter be established in the, in the witness of two or in the presence. Let a matter be established in the presence of two or three witnesses. So, when we look at things on YouTube, we don't have evidence. Somebody put something up there. Could be fake. Could be fake news. 
It could be distorted information. So I take what I listen to on YouTube with a grain of salt, and if it's something of any significant value or interest, I gotta, I gotta research it. I gotta prove it out. But my goodness, the rumors that go around and the things that are manipulated on in videos. And now with AI, they could create a whole false narrative that looks real. Um, who has uh, chapter uh, 3 John 1, chapter 1, verse 10? Uh, so if I come, I will bring up everything he is doing, including his spiritual or including his spiteful and groundless gossip about us. And as if that weren't enough for him, he refused to recognize the brother's authority either. Moreover, he stops those who want to do so and tries to drive them out of the congregation. So do you see? what's going on back then within the community of believers it's no different today look at the discord look at the gossip look at the arrogance look at the infighting it's not the kingdom of God it's not where the spirit of God is let me tell you there's a whole bunch of spirits there, I'd say. And the one that ain't is the Spirit of God. I want to read a couple more, and then I want to go back to Ephesians. You are to observe the festival of matzah, first fruits, uh, or tabernacles. And uh, I believe it's pennant, pennant, not no, shabalot. But most people don't understand that the feasts and festivals are not Jewish. God says in Vayikra 23, chapter 23, Leviticus, these are my feasts and festivals. I'm giving them to you to observe for all time, but they belong to me, they're mine. Read it. It's there. Leviticus, Vayikra, chapter 23. God begins handing down to Moses the very declaration that these are my, God is speaking, these are my feasts and festivals. You are to observe them for all time. That's a commandment. And so what do we pick and choose? Do we pick and choose? Here... And these are in these 53, 54 mitzvot in Mishpatim. Do not receive a bribe. Do, do people receive bribes today? All the time. Because it clouds and blinds clear sight, clear thinking. First fruits belong to the Lord. And so, I want to close with Ephesians 2, 18, 19, Okay, here it is. Here it is. Okay, so.
So 18. Shalom. Well, actually, seven. Shalom to you who are far off. Shalom to those nearby. That through him, Yeshua, we both have access in one spirit to the Father. So then you are no longer foreigners and strangers. On the contrary, you are fellow citizens with God's people. So I say what is was being articulated here is that the goy, they, the, those that believe in Yeshua and his sacrifice and atoning you know, sacrifice and the shedding of his blood for our sins, when we believe in him and we embrace that, what was going on here at this time, this context, there's no epistles. What, what, what was going on? Paul, Paul was teaching the Torah. What did he say? He said, you are fellow citizens, citizens just like the mixed multitude that came along with Israel in the deliverance, in the exodus. You are fellow citizens with God's people and members of God's family now. You have been built on the foundation of the emissaries, the prophets, with the cornerstone being Yeshua the Moshiach himself. In union with him, the whole building is held together and it is growing into a holy temple. Let me ask you a question. If you're a Christian, how are you being built into a holy temple and a union? If you reject the Torah, which we just proved that the very same things that are in the Torah are in the Gospels and Epistles. Now, I could research that more extensively, but unfortunately, as a volunteer rabbi, <laughs> you know, I got to work in order to survive. Even though I'm retired and on Social Security, I still have to work. So, but what are we saying here? You see, the Goy who believe as Jethro believed, Jethro came in and became a part of Israel. As the Goy of our time, the Gentiles, the name used more readily, they believe, they believe. They, they come in. Now, the Jewish community at large does not see it that way, and we understand that. But when you really look at it, that's what, that's what the Torah is saying. Salvation comes through the Jews. Okay? that simple. So when you become a believer and become a part of the nation of Israel by reason of believing and you become a citizen as Paul says, now that's rejected in large in, in the Jewish community. But as Eric read in Yeshayahu we need to read that again to understand God's attitude towards the poor and the humble. Salvation is for all men, all mankind. Now, is the present format a little sloppy and devoid of the solid knowledge and foundation of the Torah and by ignoring it, becoming sloppy? I think so. You have to decide in your own heart and seek the Lord 
to really review the content here, decide whether you want to become a citizen of Israel. Spiritually, this is a spiritual thing. You become one new man. God always intended the Goy and the, and the Hebrews to become together as one new man. That's the ultimate plan. You either, you either gather in, believe, and take hold of Israel. It says that the Goy will one day come, and I challenge the Jewish community and rabbis that are listening. You should be teaching Torah to Christian churches that are open to it, that want to learn. I'm not the greatest teacher. I'm still learning. Okay? I, I've got a lifetime. It's, it's, uh, <laughs> I don't know how many years I have left, but I still have a lifetime. <laughs> From now until whenever that is, that's my lifetime. <laughs> but... Uh, but I, I challenge you, I encourage you to open your heart to teaching those churches, those Christian groups that really want to understand the Torah and really want to see how there's a connection in the Gospels and Epistles to that. It would be a great awakening a great spiritual awakening to recognize that God always intended the nations to become part of Israel. If anything, as Jethro did, Jethro was from Midian. He, he didn't travel with the nation of Israel through the rest of the time in the desert and, and to the promised land, but he was a citizen in the spirit. He took hold of the one God the most high God above all other gods and his salvation, whether in the system back then or the system through the torture and shedding of the blood of Yeshua for the atonement. It's all about the shedding of the blood. That's where the power is. That's where God is appeased and we are reconciled. And he made a way that one man would shed his blood for all past, present, and future sins of man. God is, is satisfied that the price for mankind's sin has been paid. And it was paid by the one man, the Son of living God, Yeshua. Believe in Him and seek Him. He's looking for those who will worship Him in spirit and in truth. Shabbat Shalom. Baruch Hashem. Grace and strength to you. May you be blessed in your journey and your seeking of the Torah from Genesis to Revelation. Amen. It was I who made you, formed you.